Um, my name is Jesse Hill. I'm an associate professor here at the law school. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce this year's Brahms lecturer, Edward Larson. Professor Larson is the University Professor of History and Hugh and Hazel Darling Professor of Law at Pepperdine University, and he also um, retains a faculty position at University of Georgia, where he has taught since 1987. In 1998, Professor Larson won the Pulitzer Prize in History for his book, Summer for the Gods, The Scope Trial, and America's Continuing Debate over Science and Religion. All told, he's authored seven books and over 70 published articles, mostly about issues of science, medicine, and law viewed from an historical perspective. Um, and his books are on subjects as diverse as the election of 1800 um, and eugenics in the Deep South. Uh, Professor Larson's articles have appeared in such varied journals as Time, Nature, Science, The Wall Street Journal, The Michigan Law Review, and The Virginia Law Review, among others. Um, and he currently also serves um, uh, on the National Institute of Health Study Section for Ethics, Legal, and Social, for the Ethics, Legal, and Social Implications of the Human Genome Project. Today, Professor Larson will introduce the rich history of the creation, evolution, legal controversy in the United States in his lecture, which is entitled, From Dayton to Dover, A History of the Evolution Teaching Legal Controversy in America. Um, but before turning the, the floor over to Professor Larson, I would just like to acknowledge the support of William A. Brahms, who has generous, ge generously endowed the Brahms Lectureship. Um, it's a lecture series on law and religion, which has allowed us to bring uh, fantastic speakers such as Professor Larson here to CASE. In addition, um, I want to acknowledge the support of the CASE Center for Professional Ethics and, um, of course, Professor Bob Lowry, uh, who are also central to making this lecture possible. Finally, I want to note that this lecture is part of, the, of CASE's Year of Darwin, which is a, a fantastic uh, cross-disciplinary series of lectures and other events to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Charles Darwin's birth and the 150th anniversary of the publication of um, On the Origin of Species. So without further ado, uh, Professor Larson. Well, thank you very much for that kind invitation, uh, uh, introduction, um, Professor Hill, and also Professor Lowry for having me here. I also um, want to thank uh, William Brahms, who has endowed this lecture. It's always nice to come home. It always feels like I'm coming home when I'm coming f back to northern Ohio, since um, I uh, grew up in, in uh, uh, south of here um, and uh, get to come back as often as I can. I always hope to come back. Um, like many of you, since I grew up in your same television area, I grew up watching things like Dorothy Full Time, getting my uh, news from her, and, uh, and watching Gillardy on Sat Friday night. So, um, and as I mentioned today, I also grew up watching the Cuyahoga River burn and the uh, Indians lose. And some things, uh, the, the river's cleaned up, but some things stay the same. Um, I guess it's nice to have surety um, in the world. But it is nice to come back when... Uh, when even Toledo can beat the University of Michigan. Um, and we'll look forward to Ohio State following suit. So I think Case Western should get a football team, because you could beat Michigan this year. Um, the, um, well, you have a football team. Am I wrong? Well, you should play Michigan then. You should play, you should play Michigan. Um, you could beat them. Um, uh, I, I, um, I put, started off with putting this picture up for a reason. Um, and that's because the American controversy over creation and evolution is primarily fought and has always been primarily fought over what is taught, at least the legal fronts of the controversy, over what is taught in United States public high school biology classes. And that's why this picture from the 1920s, um, the book by the evan uh, evan evangelical who was an anti-evolutionist back then, T.T. Uh, T. Martin, is Helen the High School. And that's the book, one of the books he's selling, because that's what he's talking about, the teaching of Darwinian evolution in, in the high schools. Um, virtually no one disputes teaching the theory of evolution in public colleges and universities or using public funds to support evolutionary research in agriculture or medicine. And there is no serious debate over the core evolutionary concepts of common descent among biologists. It's the minds of American high school students that are at stake and opponents of evolutionary teaching. If I put on, as a historian, um, looking back over the disputes that have 
risen over the last hundred years. You can try to categorize them. Now, let me not overstate my categories. All these categories are always here. And there are certain complaints that don't, you know, you have to sort of push into the whole. But what historians do is they, they, they create categories to try to understand the past and make it as opposed to just an, uh, a collection of facts. Um, and so when I look back over what people have demanded, what people have asked for as really, uh, in the various phases of anti-evolutionism, um, they, they, they clump into three basic categories. One would be removing evolution from the classroom altogether just not teaching evolution or, um, or at least exempting one's own children from it. Uh, second would be balancing the teaching of evolution with some form of creationist instruction. Or third, teaching, it, teaching evolution in some fashion as just a theory. Um, now, actually these three strategies have always, if you look back over any one time, they're, all, they're always there. But for a historian, it's sort of nice that they do tend to lay out chronologically, at least with respect to which one is predominant, so you can discern three phases, three indistinct phases of anti-evolutionism in America. And so what I thought I'd do is to talk about these three phases today. Um, we'd be in the third phase now. Um, and I'll warn you, if you think I'm going too long on the first one, since it is from Dayton to um, Dover, I'll spend a little longer on the first one. The second one will, if you're watching your watch and say, we're way over, we'll never get through three with this much on the first one, uh, the second one will go rather fast because it fits in pretty closely. But Okay, so let me start with the first phase. Um, the first phase of anti-evolutionism was the one that I said was characterized mainly by efforts to remove evolution from high school biology classrooms altogether. And it was highlight, hi, hi, um, highlighted, of course, by the 1925 trial of John Scopes, the one that is the Dayton, and we're not talking about Dayton, Ohio, we're talking about Dayton, Tennessee, the Dayton and the Dayton to Dover part. Now, importantly, this effort coincided with and arose out of the so-called fundamentalist crisis within American Protestantism when many mainline Protestant denominations, the Presbyterians and the Methodists, the American Baptists, and to a lesser extent the Episcopalians and the other groups, um, were deeply divided between the so-called modernists who adapted their traditional beliefs to current scientific thinking and a new breed of fundamentalists who clung ever tighter to biblical literalism in the face of new ideas. Indeed, the very term, the fundament. The term fundamentalism was coined in 1919 as part of this. It just wasn't a term before, as part of this divide that was happening within Protestantism. And no idea split the modernists from the fundamentalist more than the Darwinian theory of human evolution, captured here by this famous picture of the, of, from Huxley of the human evolution. Now, the rift that we're talking about was, was aggravated by the seeming rise of agnosticism within the cultural and scientific elite. From the first, the fundamentalist modernist controversy, as it's called by historians, raged over the interpretations of Genesis in the pulpit. By that I mean if you look back to the late 1890s when it started, and more so in the very early 1900s, the, the conservative wing, the so-called fundamentalist in this split, and the modernists on both sides were concerned about what was being taught by their ministers in the pulpit. Were they talking about a literal Adam and Eve anymore? Or were they using Adam and Eve figuratively? Were they talking about a literal six-day creation within the last 10,000 years? Or were they taking the days of creation and doing them figuratively? Now, they had less trouble with the second than they did. The, that was a less controversial issue. People split on that. Fundamentalists split on that. But on the idea of Adam and Eve, that was a key issue, human evolution. Um, and there were battles in some of the seminaries around in America. By the 1920s, though, both sides had carried that theological dispute into the classroom. Neither side wanted the others taught as fact in public high school biology courses. 
In 1922, fundamentalists across the land began lobbying for laws against the teaching of the Darwinian theory of human evolution in public schools, leading to the passage of the first such statute in Tennessee during the spring of 1925. Now, we've got to set the scene. What happened in Tennessee was not an odd local parochial just upsurge of, of, of fundamentalist lawmaking. No, there had been a movement going on for, for at least three years, keyed on the issue of what was taught in schools. It was a battle in Ohio. Columbus, Ohio had, had limited evolutionary teaching. It was a nationwide crusade. Indeed, it was sort of like the current debate over intelligent design, such that it was a national issue. And so when anything would pop up in one state or another, West Virginia or Kentucky or Pennsylvania or Washington State, those were all hotbeds, um, it was national news. And so um, many states had imposed lesser restrictions already, passed different laws, but it was, um, it was Tennessee, the one that passed the first complete ban. Um, some conservative Christians saw it and still see it. Um, it, as the Darwinism denies a literal reading of the biblical of kind of creation and, and um, dispute the general notion of divine design in, see it as disputing the general notion of divine design in nature. Now from the outside, outset, the so-called anti-evolution crusade, and that's what it was already called by 1925, that's what his participants called it, the anti-evolution crusade, was seen as evidence of a new and profound cleavage between traditional values and modernity. And I use the evidence there in the legal term. Um, the anti-evolution crusade, in my mind, didn't cause the crusade the cleavage. It simply exposed it. It was evidence of it. You go back a generation or two before the 1920s, and Americans tended to share the same common values, or at least those Americans of Protestant European roots that set the tone back then. Oh, there were atheists and agnostics and deists in mid-19th century America, but for the large part they were marginal figures, and theological disputes among Christians rarely disrupted denominational harmony. Even the academy was a conventionally religious place, that is, until the rise of positivism and biblical higher criticism and Darwinism late in the 19th century. By the early 20th century, surveys and studies began detecting a widening gap between the God-fearing American majority and the disbelieving cultural elite. And at the heart of it, many perceived, was the scientific method as applied to all facets of life, more than any particular scientific theory. And this was seen to lie at the heart of modernity. But Darwinism was critical for applying that method to the key issues of biological origins and human morality. So when the Ten Tennessee anti-evolution statute did pass in 1925, it struck a chord that resonated widely. The national attention garnered by its passage soon focused on Dayton when a local science teacher named John Scopes accepted the invitation of the ACLU to challenge that law in court. The media promptly proclaimed it the trial of the century before it even began. As this young teacher, backed by the nation's scientific, educational, and cultural establishment, stood against the forces of fundamentalist religious lawmaking. For many Americans at the time and ever after, the Scopes trial represented the inevitable conflict between newfangled scientific thought and old-fashioned supernatural belief. Well, a little background. Like so many archetypical American events, the trial itself began as a publicity stunt. Inspired by the ACLU's offer to defend any Tennessee school teacher willing to defy the new anti-evolution statute, and they published an ad to that effect, Dayton civic leaders saw a chance to gain attention for their struggling young community by hosting a test case in the law. Indeed, the proponents of the, the test case didn't actually oppose the law. But they saw here was a chance. They would call it a summer Chautauqua, a summer lecture series, where the idea was this was not going to be an adversarial case. There was no danger of Scopes losing his job. He volunteered to be their guinea pig, as it were. H journalist H.L. Mencken, who later ridiculed the town, at, um, he ridiculed this too, but he ridiculed them as a fundamentalist backwire later. At first when he went there, he realized what it was, a publicity stunt by local people. And he, he wrote it first. In his first account from Dayton, he wrote, 
about that. The town boomers leap to accept as one man. That is the ACLU offer. Here was an unexampled, almost a miraculous chance to get Dayton on the map, to uh, upon the front pages, to get it talked about, to put it on the map. And this is what H.L. Mencken looked at the time of the trial. Scopes became their willing defendant at the invitation, the request of his boss, the head of the school board and the um, superintendent of schools. He was not even a biology teacher. He never violated the law. The young teacher was neither jailed nor ostracized. He didn't look at all like Inherit the Wind. And he spent much of the time until his trial traveling. He took a he took a uh, speaking circuit by the ACLU, took him all around the country, Chicago and New York and Washington, D.C., met the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., and he appeared at the American Museum of Natural History in, in, uh, in New York City. And he certainly wasn't ostracized. Um, he, um, he met with reporters. He was, uh, he was the star in town, and he was assured his job at the end of it all. Of course, the ill-conceived publicity stunt quickly backfired in Dayton because we well, look at the media, look what the media does things. And uh, this is Scopes being officially indicted in front of the assembled press. Um, it was too good a story. Here was a town indicting one of its own school teachers. And it's a southern town at that, at a time when there was a lot of north-south tension. Um, and that was the story. They painted this as if it was this witch hunt of this, in this town of, of this uh, local school teacher. It made for good copy. The real story, however, was that Tennessee had passed the anti-evolution statute in the first place. And that would have long roots. Um, ever since Charles Darwin first published his theory of evolution in 1859, and this is what he looked when he still had hair, um, some conservative Christians objected to the allegedly atheistic implications of its naturalistic explanations for the origin of the species, particularly of the origins of humans. That was always the big point. Further, back then, the late eight, the 1860s, say, some traditional scientists, most notably this fellow, Harvard zoologist Louis Agassiz, promptly challenged the very notion of biological evolution by arguing that highly complex individual organs I suppose, such as the eye, that was the favorite one, and ecologically dependent species, and Agassiz referred to butterflies and flowers or bees and flowers, cannot evolve to the sort of minute random steps envisioned by Darwinism. Although the science, they were in short, as we'd say today, they were irreducibly complex. You can't make little changes when you're talking about such a complex um, organ or a complex interrelationships. Now, Although the scientific community largely converted to the new theory and did so very quickly in America, within a decade, due to the theory of evolution's ability to explain other natural phenomena that appear utterly senseless under a theory of design or creation, such as the fossil record, the morphological relationship between highly dis um, distinct species, rudimentary organs um, in, in, in animals and um, the geographical distribution of species, that was probably the strongest one. Religious opposition remained. And these religious opponents often invoked the earlier scientific arguments against evolution. These religious objections naturally intensified with the spread of fundamentalism during the early 20th century, which I've already referred to. Well, the legendary American politician and orator, William Jennings Bryan, a political progressive with decidedly orthodox religious beliefs added his voice to the chorus criticizing evolution during the 1920s. As he came to see, real early in the 20s, about 1921, as he came to see Darwinian survival of the fittest thinking, which of course is known as social Darwinism, popularly known as social Darwinism when applied to human society, he came to see this as the source and root cause and we can talk about it in questions of why he thought that. But he thought it was the source and root cause of the First World War and of World War I um, militarism. And he also saw it as the source and root of post-war materialism. He, um, one of your local favorite sons, John D. Rockefeller, would, uh, would, would give, sometimes give a Darwinian explanation for his success. Um, Andrew Carnegie would as well. Um, Hill, the, uh, the railroad baron, would as well. And 
um, and you get that some with the na nations, like um, some German leaders during the war. And Brian picked up on this. He didn't like evolution before that, but he picked up on that. And of course, he'd always been one of the champion critics of Rockefeller and Carnegie and Hill and people like this. Now, of course, Brian also held religious objections to Darwinism, and he invoked Agassiz's scientific arguments as well. But his fervor on the issue arose from his social concerns. Put it the way he put it. Equate humans with other animals as the product of purely natural processes, he reasoned. Well, then they'll act like apes. With his progressive political instincts of seeking legislative solutions, to social problems, Brian campaigned for restrictions against the teaching of Darwinian theory and human evolution, leading directly to passage of Tennessee's anti-evolution statute in 1925. He spoke in dozens of joint sessions of the state legislature, including in Columbus, Ohio, to the Ohio State Legislature, um, Kentucky, and, of course, in Tennessee, leading up to the passage of the Tennessee law. He then volunteered to assist the prosecution when his law was challenged in Dayton. For seeing the pending show trial as a platform from which to promote his cause and deeply concerned that this whole thing had been set up by the ACLU and was not going to properly, they're not, the arguments weren't going to be made for his law and he wanted to be there to make them. And he also was a master of knowing how to use a public stage and he saw this was going to be a public stage. In that, indeed, he went to Dayton. He, he accepted the challenge. He accepted the offer to participate. The, the local, the good people of Dayton wanted to get, they wanted a show trial. And they wanted us, well, they called it a summer Chautauqua. They wanted to show debate. And of course, Brian hadn't argued a case in 30 years, probably, since he'd been a prosecutor. Um, he'd gone into politics. Um, but the first people they went to were people like Brian. They also went to H.G. Um, Wells. They tried to get H.G. Wells to come over. They offered to pay all the expenses to H.G. Wells, who was then a very popular pro-evolution historian. Um, well, they loved getting Brian. Um, and indeed, he, the offer for him to come was that he was in Ohio because his daughter lived in Columbus, Ohio. And he was in Columbus, Ohio when he received the offer to go down to, to, to Dayton. So his Ohio connections all over. But the bigger Ohio connection and the real bonanza came with his opponent, when, with, when Brian agreed to come, well, you couldn't keep out this favorite son of Ohio. Um, uh, Northern Ohio, in fact, he practiced, had practiced law in Ashtabula, Ohio, and that, of course, is Clarence Darrow. Um, once Brian was in, Clarence Darrow, you couldn't keep him out. By the 20s, Darrow unquestionably stood out as the most famous criminal defense attorney in America. He probably is still the most famous criminal defense attorney in America. Today, when you take polls of American lawyers of who they most admire, he wins in a landslide. Nobody's close. So I think he is the only trial lawyer in American history to ever have been on a regular postage stamp because he was a lawyer. I mean, you get people like Lincoln, who were also lawyers, you know, who, or John Adams or something, but he was on it for only being a lawyer, I presume. Um, his trials were sensational, with Darrow pioneering techniques of jury selection, cross-examination, and the closing argument to defend his typically notorious clients in bitterly hostile courts. Outside the courtroom, Darrow used his celebrity status and oratorical skills to challenge traditional notions of morality and religion. At the time, most Americans clung to biblical notions of right and wrong, with Darrow's defendants usually quite wrong. Darrow, however, with his modern mind, saw nothing as really wrong or right. Everything for him was culturally or biologically determined. For him, dogmatic beliefs springing from revealed religion were um, usually the real culprit by imposing narrow standards, dividing Americans into sects, and making people judgmental. Just as Brian, who was one of the most popular orators in America at the time, and popular writers, just as he hailed God as love and Christ as the Prince of Peace, those were the title of two of his famous stump speeches, Darrow, in his books and public speaking, damned religion as hateful and Christianity as the cause of war. Indeed, 
Darrow saw rational science, particularly the theory of organic evolution, as offering a more humane perspective than any irrational religion. He was, on the public stage, he would have been the Richard Dawkins of his day, but much bigger than Richard Dawkins is today. But the same sort of role played. This left, this viewpoint left, no ground for compromise between the two on this issue. Oh, both men, Brian and Darrow, were affable enough. They had actually cooperated on some issues throughout the past. Darrow had campaigned for Brian in Brian's three runs for the presidency of the United States. But their worldviews were at war. Well, the marquee matchup of Brian and Darrow litigating the issues of revealed religion versus naturalistic science and, and academic freedom versus popular control over public education, the two subtext, turned this trial into a media sensation then and the stuff of legend thereafter. Here's Brian in the courtroom. It attracted hundreds of reporters to Tiny Dayton and generated front page stories around the world. You could look, you just pull out a paper from one of those days and literally the whole front section of the New York Times would have been nothing but stories from the trial. And the same would be true here in Cleveland or, or, or everywhere, anywhere else. Major reporters coming from as far away as Japan and from all over Europe. It was broadcast live over the radio. It was America's first broadcast trial. You could have listened to it right here in Cleveland. Um, in time, it became the subject of Broadway plays, Hollywood movies, and Nashville songs. Clearly, Scopes remains the best known misdemeanor trial in American history. <laughs> um, you can see, if you look around in this picture, you see the microphones. Um, WGN, the great voice, uh, uh, the um, world's greatest newspaper, the, that's the microphone for WGN in Chicago, which had relays set up all around. Um, the country. You could also see, probably, if you look back, you'll see the newsreel cameras. The entire picture was filmed. The entire trial was filmed. And the, fil the, f the, 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 um, the reels were flown out that day. They made the first airport ever in Dayton. They cleared a farm field. The planes landed. And they flew them that day. And you could watch the trial the next day in Cleveland. Cleveland or New York, you go down to the movie hall, and, they, and the, the, Cleveland was one of the three towns where you could see it the next day. But you, then, you, then it was reproduced in Cle Cleveland, Chicago, and uh, in New York, you could see it the next day. And then it was reproduced, and you could see, you know, it dribbled around after that. Um, now, despite Darrow's eloquent pleas for academic freedom and his humiliating and famous cross-examination of Brian, um, there's a famous Hollywood movie of them, you see them arguing when they were put on, put on the stand. Um, Scopes ultimately lost the case, and Tennessee's anti-evolution statute was upheld. Now, that's not the way people remember it from Inherit the Wind. They remember it that Darrell must have won, but he didn't. Brian won. Um, now, why? In, in large part, that happened it resulted from the fact that the United States Supreme Court had not yet extended the constitutional bar against the government establishment of religion to public schools. That would come later. So they couldn't argue the case on First Amendment grounds. It wasn't one of the basis. They'd argue it on Tennessee state constitutional grounds, which didn't get them very far, to say the least. Um, when it was all over, though, most of the oratory occurred outside the courtroom or in the courtroom, but not to the jurors. Indeed, the jurors only spent two and a half hours of the whole eight-day trial actually in their seats because most of their testimony had nothing to do with the trial whatsoever. It had, a, it had to do about the larger issues. And, and when you analyze that, or at least when the observers back at the time analyzed it, most of them called it a, called it a draw. Um, they didn't know who won. I've, I've looked through, every newspaper was devoting major attention to it. And so when the trial was over and the verdict was ruled, they all wrote editorials. And I read hundreds of them from all sorts of newspapers. And I didn't find a single editorial in any American newspaper that thought this trial would be decisive. I mean, you watch an air at the wind, you think, by gosh, he's marching out to battle him in the Republic. It's got to be a decisive trial. And it's Spencer Tracy, no less, <laughs> against a rather foolish Frederick Marsh. Um, but no, that's not the case. Nobody thought it was decisive back then. America's adversarial legal system tends to drive parties apart rather than reconcile them. 
and that certainly happened in this case. Despite Brian stumbling on the witness stand, and he did do that, almost as bad as an inherit the wind, but this his supporters could attribute to the, his notorious interrogator's wiles. I mean, who wouldn't sound foolish if they were being cross-examined by Clarence Darrow? Um, if you put that aside, and you look at what they said inside the courtroom and outside the courtroom to the reporters and the message they conveyed, both sides effectively communicated their basic message from Dayton. Well, maybe not well enough to win many converts, but at least sufficient, sufficiently strongly to energize those already predisposed to their own viewpoint. If, as the defense claimed, more Americans became alert to the dangers of placing limit on the teaching of evolution, others, particularly evangelical Christians, became even more concerned about the spiritual and social implications of Darwinian instruction. Consequently, the pace of anti-evolution activism actually picked up after the trial. But it encountered aroused popular resistance everywhere, too. Now, two states quickly passed laws modeled after the Tennessee Act. And lots of local communities, including, that's when Columbus passed this act, um, um, banning the teaching of evolution. Lots of restrictions, state and local of different types, went to effect all around America. Um, but, as I said, there was increased resistance that you didn't see before. And, and there were some examples of it. Uh, one of my favorites is Rhode Island. When, when, in 1927, when one Rhode Island legislator introduced such a proposal in uh, his state, his bemused colleagues referred it to the Committee of Fish and Game, uh, where it <laughs> died without a vote or a hearing. And the result was a 40-year-long standoff in which a hodgepodge of state and local limits on the teaching of evolution, <laughs> most notably the one in Texas that limited what could be put in Texas textbooks, which were influential nationally, coupled with heightened parental concerns everywhere, where parents would raise the issue now, led most high school biology texts, and I would suspect, though it's tougher to get evidence of it, many, many individual teachers, virtually to ignore the subject of organic origins voluntarily. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to find any creationist instruction in these textbooks that were used, but you see evolution, the term evolution, not the underlying deep concept, but the idea of origins, they just didn't talk about biological origins in these textbooks and probably in the classrooms. As a result, after the state Supreme Court reversed Scopes' conviction on a technicality in 1927, courts did not have another chance to review anti-evolution laws until the 1960s. And by then, the legal landscape had changed dramatically, in large part because of, of this court. The change began in 1947 when the United States Supreme Court grafted the First Amendment bar against religious establishment to the liberties protected from state action by the 14th Amendment. Suddenly, the Establishment Clause took on new life. Always before, it only barred the federal government. But the federal government had rarely passed any laws respecting the establishment of religion prior to 1947, so that there was virtually no case law on point. But the states and public schools had been doing this sort of stuff all along with prayer in school and Bible instruction in school and, and, and um, well, I guess, um, I guess um, with God all things impossible on your on state mottos. Um, hence, there was a torrent of Establishment Clause litigation after 1947. Soon, scopes-like legal battles over the place of religion in public education began erupting in communities across the land, giving the old trial new relevance everywhere. The first of these cases did not address restrictions on teaching evolution, but they surely implicated them. In successive decisions beginning in 1948, the United States Supreme Court struck down classroom religious instruction, school-sponsored prayer, mandatory Bible readings, and in 1968, anti-evolution laws. Now those old laws simply banned the teaching of human evolution. They did not authorize teaching any alternative theory. Indeed, in Bryan's day, he, even William Jennings Bryan, never called for including any form of creation instruction in the science classroom because, well, because no scientific... Now, it's not that he didn't believe it. He didn't believe in evolution. He didn't believe in human evolution, I guess to be precise. But there wasn't a scientific uh, alternative to evolution back then. It was a religious objection. 
Even Brian believed that the biblical days of creation symbolized vast ages of geological time and said as much so on the witness stand in Dayton. But with the publication in 1961 by well, these two people actually, but primarily the important one is the one further back, Henry Morris, um, Virginia, Enge Virginia Tech engineering professor, Henry Morris, published this book called The Genesis Flood, 1961. And this book, for the first time, really gave believers scientific-sounding arguments supporting the biblical account of a six-day creation within the past 10,000 years. The book spawned a movement within American fundamentalism, with Morris as its Moses, leading the faithful to a promised land where science proved religion. The appearance of so-called creation science or scientific creationism, Morris used both terms, so they're really interchangeable. He sometimes called it one and the other. The appearance of this uh, launched the second phase of the anti-evolution politics, the phase associated with seeking balanced treatment for creation science. Now, creation science of the type expounded first in the Genesis flood by Henry Morris spread within the conservative Protestant church through the missionary work of Henry Morris's Institute for Creation Research, which he founded in San Diego. He moved from Virginia Tech, and he founded in San Diego with the support of a local minister um, named Tim LaHaye, who is now more famous for his Left Behind series of books. Um, but at that time was a local pastor who, f who funded with Morris the Institute for Creation Research. Morris led it. Uh, Tim LaHaye funded it. And of course, his wife founded Concerned Women for America, right? That's the right group? I think it is. Um, the emergence of the religious right, especially Bev LaHaye, Tim's wife, um, carried young earth creationism. That's what the phrase they use for it. That is a short earth, a young earth, as opposed to the long earth of William Jennings Bryan or earlier thinkers. Um, carried this young earth creationism into politics during the 1970s. Now, Henry Morris always told me that he didn't ever intend to get that much involved with politics, and, and I believe him. I don't think he really did. It was others that sort of pushed it that direction. With, he was looking for scientific evidence. Within two decades after the publication of Genesis Flood, three states and dozens of local story districts, again, including Columbus, Ohio, it keeps coming back, um, had mandated balanced treatment for creation science along with evolution in public school science classes. It took another decade before the United States Supreme Court unraveled those balanced treatment mandates as unconstitutional. Creation science was nothing but religion dressed up as science. The high court decreed in its 1987 decision, Edwards versus Aguilard. And therefore, yet teaching it was barred by, by the Establishment Clause from public school classrooms, along with every other form of religious instruction. They'd already said you couldn't teach religious instruction. Oh, you can teach about religion, but you can't give religious instruction, and this was giving religious instruction. But by this time, conservative Christians were entrenched, deeply entrenched, in local and state politics from California to Maine, and deeply, deeply concerned about science education. Well, then along comes this man. University of California law professor Philip Johnson in the third phase of what I'm calling the third phase of the creation evolution controversy. Johnson is, or at least then was, not a young earth creationist like Morris. But he was and is an evangelical Protestant with an uncompromising faith in God. His target became both the philosophical belief and methodological practice within science that material entities subject to physical laws account for everything in nature. Now, whether you call this naturalism or materialism, and depending on which book you read, he uses both terms, and both are accurate. Such a philosophy and method exclude God from the science laboratories and classrooms. Johnson typically, this is just a statement, he writes a lot, so you can see, he used to write a lot. Typical statement. The important thing is not whether God created all at once, as scientific creationism holds, or in stages, as progressive creationism or theistic evolution maintain. Anyone who thinks that the biological world is a product of pre-existing intelligence is a creationist in the most important sense of the word. By this broad definition, at least 80% of Americans, including me, are creationists, end quote. Well, Darwinism, he'll say this often, Darwinism may be the best naturalistic explanation for the origin of the species and still be wrong. 
because there may not be a naturalistic explanation. If public schools cannot teach creation science because it promotes the tenets of a particular religion, then scientific evidence of design in nature, or at least scientific descent from evolutionary theory, should be permissible, Johnson argues. After all, evolution is, as he puts it, just a theory, and in his view, not a very good one. Well, Johnson's books have sold nearly a million copies now, and it is no wonder that his kind of arguments now show up whenever objections are raised against teaching evolution in public schools. They were apparent in the United States Senate in 2001 when Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum offered legislation encouraging teachers, and I quote, to make distinctions between philosophical materialism and authentic science and to include unanswered questions and unsolved problems in their presentations of the origins of life and living things, end quote. Now, if that language doesn't sound like your typical senator talking, well, on one hand, of course, Rick Santorum is not, was not your typical senator, uh, but beyond that, he didn't write it. It was written by Johnson. Johnson admits it, Centorum admits it. I mean, it was written by them, and it, the bill was introduced. And then it passed the Senate as an amendment to the No Child Left Behind education bill, and it eventually became part of the conference report for that legislation. Now, while it's not binding law, accordingly, it spawned similar proposals in states and uh, legislative proposals as standalone bills in states and in school board guidelines, you saw it here in Ohio, um, and in local school districts. None have passed, at least as state law. But similar language has indeed made it into state and local school guidelines around the country, most famously in Kansas and in Dover, Pennsylvania. Now, before I get to those two communities, um, there's one other person who should be included in the story, and that's another popular authority on this topic, is Lehigh University biochemistry professor Michael Behe, who's a conservative Catholic, further broadening the tent of people involved here, who wrote his own best-selling book challenging Darwinist explanations for complex organic processes, and most recently served as the star witness for the defense in the challenge of Dover's school guidelines. If Johnson is the modern movement's Brian, then Behe is its Agassiz, reviving the arguments for design based on evidence of nature's irreducible complexity. Behe has never developed his arguments for intelligent design in peer-reviewed scientific articles. Indeed, he does not actually conduct research in this particular field. And along with other leaders of the intelligent design movement, concedes that there is not yet much affirmative scientific content to their so-called design revolution. In short, as Johnson recently uh, conceded himself in a radio interview that I heard, there is no scientific theory of intelligent design. There is a scientific theory or hypothesis of creation science, but not really of intelligent design. But that doesn't stop uh, intelligent design advocates from writing books and giving speeches. Indeed, um, I just pulled this up from their website, Discovery Institute website. I just sort of like this one. There are a lot more than this, but it shows the Michael Behe and Philip Johnson's initial books at the bottom of what looks to me like an evolutionary tree of, <laughs> of intelligent design literature um, coming out from there. Um, so far, if you look at these books and other works, ID theorists primarily remain critics of the reigning paradigm in biology doggedly poking holes and looking for gaps in evolution theory. These gaps are best filled by design, they argue, and would be if science did not a priori rule out supernatural explanations. Because they see that as one of the fundamental problems, and you'll see this around the country, and we'll mention it briefly different times, intelligent design advocates now propose broadening the definition of science. If, you, if the definition of science is naturalistic explanations for scientific phenomena, they're going to lose. And that's the definition that the American Academy, National Academy of Sciences and the AAAS and the different groups have, 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 have say is the definition of science. But they say that's not the real definition of science. The real definition of science should be um, uh, any account that draws on physical observable data and logical inferences. 
That's how they word it. At least they add design-based criticisms of evolution. Divorced from biblical creationism should be a fit subject for public school science education. Teach the controversy over evolution, they plead, as if there was a scientific conflict over the concepts, core concepts of common descent and natural selection. There really isn't, but there is a, there is a social conflict, certainly. With this approach, they have expanded the tent of people willing to challenge the alleged Darwinist hegemony in the science classroom beyond those preceded by Morris's evidence for a young earth. But let me qualify that. that. Legally, that's where you see. And you'll hear this. And when I go on, let me make a little ellipse here. When you, when you look at what happens in these battles, yeah, it is now intelligent design versus evolution. But I don't think that's, if you scratch below the surface, I don't think that's the real battle. I don't think that's the real issue. Every public opinion survey I've ever seen shows negligible support for a freestanding intelligent design. And every, when I do interviews or when I talk to people, everything I've seen suggests that the bedrock for anti-evolutionism in, in the United States remains the biblical literalism of the Protestant fundamentalist church where there is typically greater concerns about the age of the earth to which the Bible allegedly speaks than about such intellectual abstractions as scientific naturalism. That is, it's not that they're against intelligent design, but that's not what, where the, the real beliefs are. In the Genesis flood, for example, Henry Morris stresses the theological significance of utter fidelity to the entire biblical narrative. If you can't believe Genesis, you can't believe the Gospels, he'll say. Thus, when Genesis says that God created the universe in six days, Morris maintains it must mean six 24-hour days. And when, when it says that God created humans and all land animals on the sixth day, well, then dinosaurs must have lived alongside early man because they were created on the same 24-hour day. And when the Bible gives the genealogy of Noah's descendants, Believers can use it to date the flood at between five and 7,000 years ago. Now, you can, a, a great experience if, you have a, if you're driving to Florida, if you're just going down to your beloved sister city of Cincinnati, go across the river and go to the New Creation Museum down there, and you can see, you can see the world that these people see. And I got an advanced tour, um, so my pictures are a little old. But... They weren't quite done when I had my tour. But this is how they see it. And there's the, you know, what is it, mastodon or whatever with those long teeth with Adam there, naming them all, naming the beasts that are coming forward. And, um, and here's a, a little cave person like Pebbles with, uh, with dinosaurs <laughs> by playing by the pool. Um, and, of course, this is before the fall, so they wouldn't eat her. They only ate, you know, plants because, of course, there wasn't any they didn't eat things, because then there would be violence before the fall. Um, and that they explain all this. This is the world they see. And I think it's very instructive and very enlightening. I think it's a great place. Um, as, I told, as I told Kent Ham as I was leaving, I said, I wish I had the land right here to put a Cracker Barrel in. I'd make a <laughs> mint. I'd just clean up if I could have the Cracker Barrel here. Uh, anyway, I'm right at the intersection, because it's right on, what, 75? It's right just below Cincinnati. Well, despite judicial rulings against the incorporation of scientific creationism in the public school biology curriculum, public opinion polls suggest that approximately four or five out of every ten Americans accept the biblical creationism of the sort espoused by Morris and his Institute for Creation Research. Indeed, this and not the milk toast of intelligent design is what GOP vice presidential nominee Sarah Palin believes. If not, if these views aren't propagated by the public schools, then creationism must be spread by other means, and conservative Christian religious organizations have the necessary structures in place. Over 50 years after its initial publication, the Genesis Flood, last I checked, in its 42nd printing, that beats any of my books, continues to sell well in Christian bookstores, but now if you go to a Christian bookstore, you'll see it as just one book on a whole shelf full of like-minded books, some for kids, of showing dinosaurs with, 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 with cave children, um, others with 
Uh, there's coloring books, but also very sophisticated books, different, all different sorts of books. There's also Christian radio television. They blanket the nation. You have Christian radio stations here in town. You, have, uh, you, have, you turn on your, your network TV and your cable, and you'll get plenty of, uh, uh, of television stations. And among, many of these include creationist information um, and take a Christ, creationist viewpoint. Um, most notably, Kent Ham, who is, of course, the founder of this museum, and there he is with his dinosaur, um, one of his dinosaurs, um, his show Answers in Genesis, which you can listen to right here in, in Cleveland. Of course, it's on several. It's on a station here in Cleveland. Indeed, it's heard daily on over 750 radio stations in all 50 states, in five Canadian provinces, and 17 different countries. Um, Although still relatively low in absolute terms, the number of students receiving their primary and secondary education at home or in Christian academies has steadily risen over the past quarter century, with many such students learning their biology from creationist textbooks, most of which are published by the Institute for Creation Research. At the post-secondary level, Bible institutes and Christian colleges continue to grow in number and size with at least some of them offering degrees in biology and science education in a creation-friendly environment. And, and this point needs to be made too, and as with Brian 80 years ago, current anti-evolutionists continue, continue to stress the dire social implications of belief in evolution. And this is just one example. This is an ad that, um, uh, that I'm going to show that struck me. It was rather striking, I thought, by Answers in Genesis. It appeared in a, in a popular magazine. Um, and what it says is it has this cute little kid, blonde-haired kid on a street, playing around with a gun at your face. And as it says, if you can read it, it says... If, it, if you don't matter to God, you don't matter to anyone. As a society, if you read the rest of the trip, as a society, we reap the consequences of unquestioned acceptance of a belief in evolution every day. It diminishes our worth and reduces human beings from being made in the image of God to being mere players in the game of survival of the fittest. Find hope, find truth, find answers in Genesis. That's a, that's a prominent theme when Governor Michael Huckabee of Arkansas wrote a book about the killings in his state at Jonesboro. What did he blame? Why did kids kill was the name of the book, and he blamed evolutionary teaching along with a variety of other things. With a solid majority of people in some places believing creation science and an added percentage everywhere accepting intelligent design, teaching the theory of evolution inevitably becomes highly controversial in some places. In 1999, for example, in Kansas, a uh, creationist in the state school board succeeded in temporarily deleting the Big Bang and what they called macroevolution from the list of topics mandated for coverage in public school science classrooms. And here's the, the crew from Intel, uh, Intelligent Design Crew. That's Michael Behe there, some others, testifying before the Kansas school board. Um, in 2006, they took the further step in Kansas of adding an ID-friendly definition of science to the state's educational standard. That is, they made it in their the state standards now, gave a new definition of what was science. And, of course, it was the one I read before. That's what I was quoting from. Um, in, in 2004, the Cobb County, Georgia School Board decreed that biology textbooks should carry a disclaimer stating that evolution was just a theory. In 2005, the Dover, Pennsylvania School Board mandated not only an oral disclaimer akin to Cobb County's written one, but recommended intelligent design with a capital I, capital D, as an alternative explanation of biological origins. This year, Louisiana passed a state law encouraging public school teachers to teach the intelligent design-inspired uh, controversy over evolution. In cases that made front page news across the country and overseas, federal district courts in, 19, in 2005 and 2006 struck down Cobb County and Dover's restrictions. And what I'll close with is talk about those two rulings if I have time, if that's okay. Both rulings I find are instructive as they reflect the current state of the law in this area. Now the law can always change because the membership on the courts can change, but for now this captures the law. So let me quickly go through them. Um, responding to concerns of local parents and taxpayers, the Cobb County School Board had mandated the biology textbooks carry this disclaimer in the front of every textbook. 
Evolution is a theory, not a fact, regarding the origins of living things. This material should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically concerned. Here, this is the actual sticker. This is a, cop a picture of the actual sticker that they put in the, the, the boards. Similar disclaimers have appeared in Alabama textbooks for years without sparking lawsuits and are under co consideration elsewhere, but perhaps because of the diverse nature of the county's population and its visible location as a bedroom community for Atlanta within the conning towers of CNN, the disclaimer immediately encountered stiff opposition in Cobb County. The Georgia ACLU promptly filed suit on behalf of some local students and their parents. In his judicial opinion, Judge Clarence Cooper tackled the anti-evolutionists only a theory argument. Of course evolution is only a theory, he wrote, but it's not a hunch or a guess. He added, quote, the stickers target only evolution to be approached with an open mind, carefully studied and critically considered without explaining why it is the only theory being so isolated. In light of the historic opposition to the theory of evolution by certain religious groups, Judge Cooper concluded, and again I'm quoting, that an informed, reasonable observer would perceive the school board to be aligning itself with proponents of religious theories of origins. As such, the sticker constituted an impermissible endorsement of religion under the prevailing constitutional standards, O'Connor's test, as it were, which was then the prevailing view. Um, so that captures the only, that captures the law with respect to a uh, disclaimer like this. Now, the Dover case, like the Cobb County one, involved school guidelines built on the ID argument that students should be told that evolution is a controversial and unproven theory. Um, here, I've got a copy of it. Uh, uh, the first two parts read very much like it, and I shortened them because it's, it's longer. It's, it's an oral disclaimer. It's going to be read. And then I have the third one written out in, in told, but I don't think I've edited out anything too important. Um, as it says, the theory is a fact, is not a fact, the disclaimer claims. There are gaps in the theory for which there is not evidence. Now, this alone constituted an, un, uh, um, an unconstitutional endorsement of religious viewpoint, the court ruled. But this is nothing different than had been ruled in Cobb County. These were what were at stake in Cobb County, and the ruling was the same. But unlike the Cobb County sticker, however, the statement in Dover went on to include that other paragraph. Intelligent design is an example of the origins of life that differs from Darwin's view. A reference book of pandas and people is available for students who might be interested in gaining an understanding of what intelligent design, again, capital I, capital D, actually involves. Um, the text, the now let's break this apart. And first the court looked at the text of pandas and people. And they concluded that that's just a creationist text. That's not an ID test. That's a creation, creationist religious material, including affirmations that basic kinds of living things, such as birds and fishes, were separately created for which there is only religious authority. As such, its use in public schools viola, as a, and not as a, as a, as a, as a doctrinal book, um, violated the constitutional bar against religious instruction. But now the decision goes further. So it's already done pretty obvious things that earlier courts had done. But here's where it gets interesting. That um, During a six weeks trial, Judge John Jones, and there is his picture, heard extensive testimony on intelligent design to determine whether it, not of pandas of people, but the actual concept of intelligent design, whether intelligent design to determine whether it could be presented as an alternative theory of origins in public school science class. Here, his decision broke new ground. It just hadn't been dealt with it. Jo 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 uh, Jones wrote, after a searching review of the record and applicable case law, we find that while ID arguments may be true, a proposition on which this court takes no position, ID is not science. And then he gave three reasons. First, unlike science, ID involves supernatural explanations. Second, it rests on the flawed argument that evidence against the current theory of evolution supports a design alternative, as opposed to something else. Third, scientists have largely refuted the negative attacks on evolution leveled by ID theorists. The judge stressed, uh, ID, the judge stressed, has not been accepted by the scientific community. It has not generated peer review publications, nor has it been subject to testing and research. And what was so crucial is he based this on the testimony. Here is a drawing from the New Yorker. Uh, he's in the background there. Um, and that's Michael Behe on the stand. And 
under rigorous cross-examination, as rigorous as, well, not quite as bad as Brian's face, but somewhat equivalent to it, um, sitting there as the expert witness for the, uh, for the, for the, uh, the defense, defending the law. He conceded every one of those points. He conceded in clear terms that ID is not accepted by the scientific community, that it hasn't generated peer review publications, it has not been subject to research and testing. Indeed, uh, he said, well, then how can you say it's science? And he said, because I don't think that's the definition of science. That's not what people really use. So what definition would it meet? The attorney asked, and he said, well, what I think science is, is, quote, a proposed explanation that focuses or points to physical observable data and logical inferences. Well, then the attorney comes back and says, well, what else meets your test, Mr. Behe? What about astrology? Yes, astrology would meet the test. What about the Ptolemaic theory that the sun, Earth is at the center of the universe and the sun goes around it? Yes, that would meet my test. Um, well, this alone probably sealed the decision. Um, but evidence that the school board members acted with a clear religious purpose and then tried to cover up their tracks also persuaded this judge, John Jones, sitting there in the back, a no-nonsense conservative who was nominated by Senator Richard, Rick Santorum and appointed by President George W. Bush, uh, turned him against the policy. He concluded, the breathtaking inanity of the board's decision is evidence when considered against the factual backdrop which has now been fully revealed at trial. Well, in conclusion, in Dover, as in Cobb County, the school board's decision to adopt the anti-evolution disclaimer polarized the community. It divided families, neighborhoods, and churches. In an election held before the court ruled, voters replaced all eight members of the school board with candidates opposed to the policy, guaranteeing that there would be no appeal to the court's ruling. When Americans on either side of this controversy watch what happened in Cobb County or in Dover, they know that they are looking at a mirror and wonder how it might play out in their own hometown, among their friends and fellow Christians. Of course the media took notice, making these cases top stories of the year. Indeed, my gosh, he was so proud of this. Time magazine put Judge John Jones on the cover as one of the 100 the lives and ideas of the world's most influential people. And there is Judge Jones right there on the bottom line. Um, that, in brief, is where the creation evolution teaching controversy stands to stay. Still making news 80 years after Dayton, Tennessee, garnered headlines by prosecuting John Scopes. Indeed, they're still capitalizing on it. You can go down there every summer. This was the 75th when they had me come and speak. But you can go every summer and see a reenactment of the trial on the exact days of the trial, and you can still buy little car carved wooden monkeys um, and visit the Scopes Trial Museum there in town. They've tried to get what they can out of that trial. It resurfaces, this, this controversy resurfaces periodically in countless Daytons throughout the United States over everyday episodes of science teachers either defying or deifying Darwin. Such acts generate lawsuits and legislation precisely because religion continues to matter greatly in America. Public opinion surveys inevitably find that nine out of ten Americans believe in God, just as they found since those surveys began asking that question over 50 years ago. A recent survey indicated that three-fourths of all Americans believe in miracles and that three out of five of them now say that religion is, quote, very important in their lives. It troubles many Americans that science does not affirm their faith and outrages some when their children's biology cor coursework seems to deny their biblical beliefs. As a diverse people, we have learned to seek middle ground wherever possible. As a species, however, we instinctively respond to stirring oratory. Brian and Darrow had mastered that craft and used it in Dayton to enlist their legions. They tapped into a cultural divide that deeply troubles this national house of ours, offering us no middle ground. And as we all know, either from the Bible or from a Broadway classic, he that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. Well, that wind has been sporadically touching off maelstroms over the past 80 years, storms that sorely test our tradition of tolerance. If history is any guide, dark clouds remain on the horizon. Thank you. Some people might have to leave. Um, I think
we have time for a little bit of q and Please wait for me to bring you the mic because um, this is being uh, recorded. I, re I realize it's late, so I won't feel hurt if anybody leaves. <laughs> yes, I'm from Ohio, and I know dinner time 6 o'clock <laughs> as those meatloaf and potatoes are waiting. Uh, Professor Larson, thank you for the history of the legal battle here in this country. But what I was wondering is if you knew if there was a comparable legal battle in Europe. Did they go through the same agony that we are? Well, no, you mentioned Europe. Um, um, uh, th this is not an, um, just an American phenomenon. But there's not really comparable in Europe. There are some battles. It depends on where you are in Europe. There's a there's a real battle in Poland. The, recently, the um, the Minister of Education in Poland has urged intelligent design to be used in Poland. There's a battle in Turkey where there's a big intelligent design movement in Turkey, and that's partly in Europe. If you look at your map very carefully, um, the. Um, England recently um, authorized um, and started funding the um, schools that teach creationism as an alternative in England, state-funded schools. Of course, throughout Europe, there's a large, now there's a large Muslim population. And in many countries, not France, because they don't allow it, but places like the Netherlands try to provide a, their own schools. They provide uh, Muslim schools. And, and of course, whenever you're dealing with a Muslim-dominated um, curriculum, you're going to get creation science taught. Um, it's a, um, uh, to my knowledge, there is no Islamic country where they teach evolution. Um, I know in some Islamic countries it's a capital offense to teach evolution. I was warned that in Morocco when I was there and I said, well, don't worry, I'm not going to talk on this topic. You're safe. And it says, well, now we're, you're safe. They said. Um, in fact, last year, or earlier this year, um, it's interesting, um, South Africa became the first country in all of Africa to teach evolution because it's just as controversial in sub-Saharan Africa, which is, tends to be Christian dominated. So you don't see it there. Um, it's very limited teaching of evolution in, in Latin America. The Pacific Islands, it's, there's, you, you don't see it because, you know, there's a lot of activity by Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses and fundamentalist Christians. And you go over to countries like Samoa or, or Fiji, you won't see evolution being taught. Um, it's, it's, so it's, it's not, and there are certain areas, South Korea, there's Philippines, there's, it's, it's a worldwide phenomena. It's not limited to America. Recently, I was in Uganda, to give, of all places, to give some talks. And I was staying at the university there, Makarov, in, uh, in uh, Kampala. And the, uh, the, the, little, the little guest house I was staying in, you know, there were a couple of rooms, had a TV, and it only had eight channels. And one of them was the government's channel with this talking head giving the news. And it's all in English, of course, because it's an English country. Every single other channel was a Christian broadcasting network with most of their programs American um, programs, you know, like, like Pat Robertson or whatever. And they were all Christians. Um, so I'm sure there's, you know, they're all Christians from Uganda because they're either Muslim or Christian. So it's not an American phenomenon, but U.S. Europe, um, you know, it, it rises. There's some, in the Muslim conclaves, areas of Europe, it is a big issue. There are some groups in England, there's certainly a, a group in Poland, which have enough to have influence. Other places, you know, the, you know there, it comes, Austria, there's a little concern. The Archbishop of, of course, the Archbishop of, of, Venice, of, Vienna, of Vienna works with intelligent design groups very closely, and he publishes articles in America, and published an article, what, last year, year before, in the New York Times, which was written for him by by the Discovery Institute and placed. So there's a little bit, but not nearly as much as there is in, in Africa, say. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things. First, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in a Muslim country, and I can assure you that I taught evolution. Oh, they did? Modern which one was that? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have said, I shouldn't have gone there. I was thinking of North Africa. I was thinking of North Africa. Yeah, they're brilliant yeah. Muslims. Yeah, you're right, you're right. You're right in Malaysia, so, correct. Right. But you won't find it in Mali, you won't find it in oh, no, no, I'm um, sure that Tunisia or those yeah, countries. Yeah, anyway, or Iran. Uh, what, what prompted me, uh, the next thing, that's where I taught. I consider myself both a science educator and a lawyer. Uh, most, uh, that's when I was a science educator. I taught physics and mathematics in, at the college level in Malaysia. And uh, I've been a lawyer most of the time since. Uh, and what I'm wondering if we can take the debate and listening to the whole thing this year, um, to a higher level, it solved the Darwin controversy. 
and, and by combining legal method and scientific method as a frame of reference. And what I'm getting at is the debate, as I see it, is really a debate over content. You know, it's natural selection or whatever Darwin stands for. Do you know that content? You're not learning scientific method when you study Darwin, uh, necessarily. And you should be. Uh, and, of course, legal method is very is first, <clears throat> why don't we avoid uh, the debate or dispute uh, by evolution is a word that apparently honks off a certain group of religious people. Well, let's define it more precisely. What scientists are really doing is trying to figure out biological change. I don't know whether name change would be more helpful, but no biologist today talks about you know, they talk about molecular genetics. Let's teach molecular genetics in high school uh, rather than call it evolution because it's gone way beyond what Darwin did. Okay? Well, many states do what you suggest. Um, if you look over the school guidelines, there are many state guidelines that don't use the term evolution. They don't use the E word. I mean, uh, Illinois doesn't. They, I think they don't. They didn't used to last time I looked at it. They use the word development instead. Um, so schools do that. The, uh, the problem with that is that evolution, um, ho however you want to term it, evolution is a core concept in biological thought. Um, and um, it's, it, it is what's, there, there, uh, most schools have, a, most colleges, uh, research universities have a department of evolutionary biology. And they look at questions and you, um, you, uh, from an evolutionary viewpoint. Now, they also have genetics and they also have molecular biology, but uh, evolution is the core concept that's tying it together. And when, when, you, when you look at uh, the development of, of, if you're doing agricultural research or, or, or medical research, you're looking at the evolutionary development of viruses and how to deal with, the, with viruses that evolve and you try to deal with, and you, 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 you deal with plants and animals in, in, in agriculture. So it, I agree with you that, that it's important to teach the scientific method. And I, I mean, my kids are in middle school. That's what they're learning. I think it's great. I, I think you underestimate um, science education because I think what science education is trying to do is to try to teach the scientific method. But, you know, you still have to. And, and that should be the focus, and I agree with it. And in many places, a way to deal with the issue is probably to avoid a buzzword that creates a problem, and that's what, well, that's what Illinois has done. So I think that certainly should be in the, in the, um, um, in the um, panoply of, of options. Now, is that the issue? Um, you know, some places, they want an alternative idea, that is, direct creationism being taught. And that's not a scientific method. But I do think, I do think it may be a very effective way to teach the scientific method to tell students about intelligent design or creation science and to show this is a possible explanation. You may or may not believe it, but you can, you can, you can, you can talk about it to show the difference between that and a scientific method. So I don't think that automatically Creation science or intelligent design should be excluded from classrooms if you're using it pedagogically to help the students better understand the scientific method and how to learn science. And so I think that's a way, but these are ways that individual teachers can use these, approach, use these different approaches and hopefully get somewhere because you're right. If you're simply alienating the students and creating a divide, you're not teaching anything. And so I appreciate your, your sort of suggestion. Do we have time for another question? Maybe one more, quick one. For one more, or do we want to end? Oh, there, right. uh, oh I, Patricia, I'm probably going to say either one. Patricia, I talked to her. So. I'll, give, I'll, I'll let her quickly speak, too. She may want to talk about some of the other things. Go ahead.
like we should choose uh, which period to teach in, uh, in the school. But um, I also have an um, idea that the many scientists right now thinking that Big Bang uh, didn't happen on its own. So the also sometimes <laughs> Uh, good point. Good point. That's why I always stressed, it probably sounded meaningless to you, and you probably wondered what I was doing when I was always saying capital I, capital D. Because intelligent design is a capital I, capital D, and that's what was in the Dover. I could go back and show you the Dover standard somewhere there. It's capital I, capital D. That is a particular theory that's espoused by Behe and Johnson and Bill Dembski and some other people. Um, that's a clearly articulated idea. What you're talking about is the broader idea of there's order or there's design in the original creation, um, in the original laws of nature, it can, the anthropic principle, um, that there's just too orderly. That's coming more out of physics. The, well, this is not what they're talking about here. But you're right, that's an area that I agree that science does not have an answer for. And there are many scientists, including many very credible scientists, like Francis Collins, head of, head of the Human Genome Project, or, or Ken, Mil Ken, um, Ken Miller, who wrote the most popular biology textbook in America at Brown University, would totally agree that that sort of level of design, that would be a little i and a little d. Well, it wouldn't have the i, it would be design, it would just be a, just be a, just be a design. But that's more the anthropic principle, so that's more in physics than what they're talking about. What th when they're thinking of intelligent design, they're talking about God or an intelligent designer directly designing either the individual species, which would be Phil Johnson's argument and Bill Dembski's argument, each species, each kind is designed, each biological kind, or if you're Michael Behe, that God comes in and designs some key things in the evolutionary process, like blood clotting or, or the flagellum or, or different things, or the, you know, and, and then, or the eye, and puts that into the evolutionary process. So there you're having God intervening in the, in the process of evolutionary development. And so that's why I was trying to make the distinction between the two. But you're absolutely right with that, with that, with that idea about, about broader design, and that would be beyond the realm of what we're talking about here. So very good point. Thank you for that qualification. You have one, I would have one thing. Everybody's already left anyway. Who needs to, who needs to catch the, uh, the, the, the ball game tonight? Well, one thing is that uh, I don't know if you disagree, but it seems like all of the kinds of patients you find around the world these are all exported from the U.S. They didn't have that. Iraq, for example, used to have a prominent uh, paleontologist in the world. It's one of our exports. It's yes. quite well. Yes, yes. I just said it's not limited to America. I'm just saying, yes. Right. Um, Basically. On, on well, issues, it, that's why I focused on, on Henry Morris. You can trace it all back to Henry exactly. Morris. Exactly. You really can. Yeah. Yeah. You really can. And his books are translated in every country. Virtually every country, uh, virtually every language. It's not that it's... Uh, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as far as uh, using it uh, in the public school science classroom to teach the difference between science and math, it's really tricky um, because we really want you know, the child in third grade or even as a high schooler to go in and learn that science simply does not support the many hearts or the earth as it comes out in these other things, that it's science shows that it's not scientifically clear. Uh, that seems to me an attack on the education is completely right. unnecessary. Well, yeah, and I wasn't really talking about those. I was more talking about intelligent design. But I, again, it would have to be at a, I would think, I was thinking maybe at a higher level. I, a lot of people can do it in college, um, where, um, I, but, I it, but it's, I mean, there you I do, do. you do it in college. But you're right, you raise a very good point, and I agree with that. The idea would be you can't be attacking, it's also you, 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 the church, Schools shouldn't be, they should be neutral on the subject of religion. They shouldn't be attacking um, um, uh, a religion either. That's not their business. That too would violate the establishment of I totally agree with you. Good point. See, that's why I wanted her to get a word in, because I knew she was going to uh, make sure that I was clearly understood. Thank you. Theology, uh, sorts of things, but they were conservatives. Uh, uh, with, uh, 
theological concerns. Yes, you just opposed to mainline Christianity. Well, I was just opposing to modernist Christianity. Main, mainline, that's mainline's a little confusing right now because you've got the neo, neo, uh, neo, the neo orthodoxy who changed everything, and Karl Barth and those others came. But it's so much about Catholic, theological concerns. Right. Well, and it's dangerous. You correct. It, it's dangerous to always use the terms conservative and liberal because they carry so much more meaning, and that's why the term they would use would be modernist, and they would have been used. They, they Brian would have used the term fundamentalist. Um, we would now call him evangelical because he didn't thought what would now be called modern fundamentalist. He would be more of an evangelical today. But these terms keep changing, and you use them today, and people understand the other meanings, and it creates problems. It does create problems. Thank you. Thank you.